All right, guys, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show, where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We're your host today, Glenn and Amber. Hello, everybody. And we are thrilled to have somebody here that shares a lot of our values that we are just getting to know him. And we're excited about bringing him here to you guys as a guest today. And um, I want to introduce this guy. So Mark Willis is a certified financial planner. He's also an author of several books. He uh, teaches people how to build real wealth, which if you just heard our tagline is about uh, exactly what we help people do. And I love this part too, is that he helps people become their own bank. And as you guys know, we talk a lot about flipping and building rental portfolios and all that kind of stuff. And I, I tell you, I'm excited to jump in today and learn about being our own bank. We do a little, little lending, but I sure would like to know more about what you do. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much, guys. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Tell us a little about you, because I'm, I'm, I want to dive into you and kind of what you do. Tell, where, are you, where are you from? What part of the country are you from? Sure. Well, um, I grew up in uh, the Midwest, Indiana specifically. And, Hoosiers. Uh, went, went, yeah, go Hoosiers. And uh, went down to Texas for a few years, my seven years in the desert, as I say. And then uh, for college. We're, we're in Texas. We're in oh, Texas. Uh, yeah, I know you're from the uh, Texas area. Where in Texas are you from? Uh, I, I, DFW, yeah. DFW. So yep. my wife and I met in uh, North Richland Hills. Fell oh in my love gosh. There. <laughs> yeah. Where I lived. I lived oh, right on. Oh, yeah. There's some, there's some great chemistry there. And then we, uh, we, we went to school in Abilene. Uh, Abilene okay. Christian University is where we went to school. In fact, it has something to do with our in, our story, which I can share with you guys if you want. But please, yeah, yeah. When we um, we just so happens they weren't just handing out college degrees for free back then, and uh, we graduated from our school with th three private school degrees between us, with six figures of student loan debt, uh, which felt like I had married two women in college, not one. <laughs> one was my beautiful wife. One was Sally May. And all of a sudden, we had a regular uh, renter in our in our lives that didn't um, didn't pay us, but took money out of our pocket every month. So yeah. that was sort of where life started for us. But uh, we then since now we live in Chicago, Chicago land, mm -hmm. and uh, are having tons of fun working with clients all over the country. Oh, cool! So that's awesome. So so tell us a little about how you help people build wealth because I know that you're obviously tied to what we do, right? We're you know, our, our audience knows we flip, we flip and hold, we have our home building workshops that we put on and everything. And we love helping everyday people create wealth through real estate. That's like we did. We were, you know, we were, when we started this journey 13 years ago, we were $80,000 in credit card debt. So I know the debt, I know the debt monster. She's not a good mistress. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? so it's right. Not good. Mm -hmm. So, so you know about that pain, but I like to hear about kind of, I, I like to hear some of your journey. Actually, how did you come out of, how did you figure that out? And how did you get into what you do now? Well, and I'll mention what we did then, but also what matters now for most of your listeners is, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a pretty major fundamental shift in the way the world is going to work uh, going forward. Uh, I mean, everything from how you buy your groceries to how you interact with your tenants uh, or how you interact with your vendors uh, is going to change for the rest of at least the next few years, probably. Uh, yeah. But there are a few things that won't change. Uh, there are a few things that uh, will not change, even in as, as crazy and as wild as this is about to get. And I don't know if this will air before or after the election. So, you know, we could have space aliens uh, in the news yeah. before this goes, no uh, before this airs, you know, for where yeah. 2020 seems to be headed. Yeah, uh, no but one thing. thing that won't change is something that's in all of our lives. I don't care if you're in debt up to your eyeballs or if you are paying cash for everything, banking is a part of your financial life. And that has not changed. And we all, both of all three of us here on this uh, recording here today, uh, have experienced the debt staircase uh, where we had not enough money to buy that thing, whatever it was, a piece of real estate, credit cards, student loans in our case. So what did we have to do? We didn't have the cash that moment. So we tumbled down the debt staircase. And then what happened? 30 days later, the Pied Piper, right? Uh, so now we're on a 30 day schedule to pay that monthly payment. Uh, the, the Piper comes calling. So we're making those monthly regular scheduled bank payments to a bank and flowing money out of our pocket and into theirs. The average American as of 2020 before Corona started, but the beginning of 2020 uh, was spending 36% of his or her income on debt according to the US Commerce Bureau. 36% of your income. Wow. Is that so, right? 30, 36% of the average person who spent that their income is going towards a debt payment of some that's type. That's right. Yeah. So right there, that should tell us some pretty interesting things. Now we're only saving 5% before Corona. It went way up to 17% due to the stimulus, putting money in your pocket, but now it's coming way down again. 
since you know we're not getting a second stimulus as of this recording anyway. Uh, we'll right. see after the election. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, bottom line is we have a massive problem with time because remember, time is money. And if banks are getting 36% of your money, they're getting 36% of your time. Now, what's a 36% of your day? You know, if you're working the average cycle where you've got a mortgage, you got a car loan, you got some student loan debt, you got a credit card, a third of your day, you are a slave to a bank. Mm -hmm. And you throw taxes on top of that. Half of our lives, we're working for somebody else, even if we think we're our own boss. Yeah. So the biggest problem is not the interest rate. We all have very low mortgage rates, very likely. We all have very low uh, car loan rates, most of us. It's not the rate, it's the volume. Uh, just like the vaccine that we're all hoping we see soon, uh, it's not going to be the rate that injection goes into my arm that'll save me or inoculate me to the virus. It's the volume that counts. The volume will either save my life or if they put two gallons in me, I'll, I'll probably keel over dead, right? So yeah. the volume of interest is what's killing most American families before the virus, but it's also what's providing the wealth, sh uh, sh uh, the wealth injection into every bank across this country. You know, when I was in Texas, Amber, uh, there were always three little uh, buildings in these small little Texas towns along I-20 as I left DFW for Abilene. And the three little buildings on these tiny little towns were the bank, the church, and the bar. Yeah. And, and I felt like that's kind of the order you went in. You know, you went to the <laughs> bank to beg for money. Uh, you went to the church to pray. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you went to the bar to drink your sorrows away. And that in was our town, there's one more. There's also pharmacies. There's pharmacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pharmacies. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So anyway, that, that is kind of the, the thing that I see not changing. Now, for me and my wife, we had student loan debt. So banks were a part of our life before we even realized what the word budget meant or how to spell budget. And right away, we got hit with the, the massive bill. And we had to start you know, hit, hitting the ground running. Uh, finding ways to pay for that debt. And so sure. part of our job was, how do we do the debt snowball method? How do we follow Dave Ramsey? But there was something along the way that kind of woke us up. And we said, what's, what's wrong with paying debt off the snowball way, the, the old fashioned way, as it were. And we realized at that moment that every dollar we were throwing at our debt was money we'd never see again. But also gone is all that that $1 would have grown to had we left it invested instead. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's at that moment we realized that we truly are tied down to the banking system, whether we pay cash or we're in debt. So whether we are in debt, servicing that debt, Sally Mae and all of her cronies, or we're paying, saving up and then paying cash for the cars or our real estate flips or whatever else, every time I pay cash for something, I'm actually financing that too by passing up the earnings I could have earned on that dollar had I left it invested and not bought that thing, whatever it was, that car or whatever else. Sure. So you finance everything you buy. That was the big wake up call we had. And what made us realize that the only way to truly escape that, that gravity of the banking system was to take banking back. It's not that banking is a problem. I think banking just is. I mean, there's actually a great book out there called Debt, The First 5,000 Years by David Graeber. Okay. Great history about banks. It's as old as human civilization. Banking is. We're already in the banking business. We just don't realize it. We're sitting on the wrong side of the banker's desk. So the true way to be, to be free from the, the, the gravity of the debt staircase and the saving problem of saving and then paying cash and losing growth, the only way free from that, from my experience as a certified financial planner, is to become the bank, to literally take that banking function, bring it back in-house, both Mark, for your business and your family. Dive into that, because I think that's an important piece that I think that I want people to understand. I get it, but I never heard it put the way you just put it. Because people sometimes say, what do you do with your money? We actually, will, any money we have, we loan out at a much higher rate. So we're loaning out at 14% or whatever. We're loaning out at a higher rate with our own money instead of um, uh, paying cash for things. But I think don't, people don't think that way. And I Dive into that for a second. I think when you say that you're a slave, even though you pay cash, people think that, no, no, I'm free. I pay cash for everything. I'm free of debt. Dive into that for a second, because that, that was powerful what you said. And I want you to expand on that for a second for our listeners, because I think that's a, that's a, a, it's a very unique perspective yeah. you just brought to that point that I think people overlook. And this is, this is a good gold nugget here right now. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, let's think about it. If you're 
if you're just thinking about, let's, let's think of a regular major purchase. So I love that you guys are loaning money out. You are everyone else's bank. And that's awesome. Getting that kind of yield, 14%. I assume you're loaning that out like a private money lending sure. scenario. Is that kind of the idea? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that is awesome. And I think that's something that every person can get behind and get and take a hold of. Uh, you know, what I would like to say is why not be your own banker also? Why, why leave it to everyone else? You know, why, why not use the same banking strategy to take it in-house as well? Let's give you a quick example if I can get you some numbers. Is that okay if I share some numbers? Sure, right, of course. This? So of let's course. just imagine, you know, somebody who's putting away like, oh, you know, six grand a year in taxes. And that's, that's, the, that's the tax bill. That's the annual large expense that this person has to set aside. So maybe he's making 50 grand a year and he's paying six grand a year in taxes. Well, what does six grand a year mean? Well, that's not a lot of money, but if you think about it, what if you could find a way to earn somehow, live in the Cayman Islands or whatever, you save six grand a year instead of having to spend it? What mm -hmm. happens then uh, for, let's say, let's say he's a young guy and he's gonna save for 40 years. Let's say he can get a conservative interest rate of 4%. Uh, what's, what's the end result? If you if you had been able to somehow get a, a nominal percentage rate, I'm I'm doing four percent. Let's do four percent for forty years, six grand a year of taxes. That grows to five hundred and seventy thousand yeah. bucks if you didn't spend that money every year. And six grand is not a lot in taxes. No, now it's let's not. think about now let's think <laughs> about our cars. That'd be a great right? year. Six thousand taxes oh, would be a great man. year. <laughs> yeah, come on. So half a million bucks gone just because of how we paid our taxes. Now what about cars? If you buy 10 cars, each at 30,000 a piece, $300,000 gone, that's the dollar number gone. But what if you had 300 grand earning some sort of interest over a, over a lifetime, right? If you had $300,000 earning 4% over 40 years, that grows to $1.4 million. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money just for buying our stinking cars. Add sure. vacations, what about our real estate flips? What about our kids' college? It yeah. just takes millions of dollars just to live our lives, right? Just our own lives. We all have major capital purchases. So the big power here is when you become your own banker, when you're able to take back that function of banking and pay yourself an interest rate rather than it just being gone to the ether whenever you pay cash for the car or the kid's college, boom, all of a sudden, it does not matter anymore what my mutual fund did last month because I'm now collecting that 36% of my net after-tax income to my future. And I'm getting growth along the way. That's the power of being your own banker. Uh, and in addition to what you guys, awesome, the awesome thing you do to be everyone else's banker as well. Sure, so how, how does somebody make that? I'm curious how you made the transition. So you guys are $100,000 in debt. I'm curious, because you, that, I'm, I'm, this is just a pure guess that your journey probably has created your now lifestyle and your future. Because you probably figured it out. That's what most entrepreneurs do, right? We, we live some beat up, run down the road, kicked around a little bit, we figure it out, and then we teach other people. So you somehow got yourself on a better path. And then how do people, because other people are probably going to be saying, okay, so great, be my own banker. I don't have any money. What do you, what do you want me to do? Right? That's, I, what they're, that's what they're trying to say now. So actually, I, right. I, I think that's a really good train of thought. I think I want to know what was your aha moment before that journey started though? Mm. Mm. Well, it was, it was really just realizing, hey, we're in our mid-20s, my wife and I, at that moment we were. Not anymore, but uh, in that moment, we no. were uh, mid-20s and we realized the most powerful dollars in our life are in our pockets right now. And we didn't have a lot. We were negative net worth. We had a little bit of cash every month from our day jobs and our side jobs and all that. But every dollar we were putting toward our debt was a dollar we'd never see again. And so the aha moment for me was the bank is in control. The bank is taking my most powerful dollar I'll ever see ever again. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to be on this debt staircase. And it was also a moment when someone brought me aside and, and asked me the question, Mark, he said, Mark, is it possible that Dave Ramsey could be wrong about something? All of a sudden, my, my mind got kind of blown because I realized he wasn't necessarily you're, writing. You were a loyal account. follower. You were a follower yeah. of that. Oh, yeah. So then, okay, <laughs> got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I was, uh, I was, you know, it was helping us. So our story is we went from $120,000 of student loan debt down to about 70 grand when we, when we got that aha moment, Amber. And it's in that moment that we realized that we could become our own banker. And it wasn't just a concept. It wasn't just, well, that's a nice idea. 
we found some particular logistical tactical strategies that we could employ with not a lot of cash. We were still upside down net worth wise when we started this process, but slowly and surely we were able to build up real wealth uh, no matter what the markets were doing. This was in the midst of, you know, watching, I was working at that time for a CPA doing some tax prep, listening to her make phone calls to some of her clients where she had, you know, invested some of their monies saying, Hey, Mr. Client, I'm sorry. I know you're 63 years old, but I just lost you half of your life savings. Yeah, right. So, it was a tough so oh my goodness. I never wanted to, I, I almost got out of the financial world just because I never wanted that. To have conversation that conversation. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know what I think is really important about what you just brought up though, is the importance of being open-minded. Because, you know, we do, we get stuck in our own ways and our own belief systems, you know, even, even belief systems from childhood, not just something that, you know, not just other education that we've had, but we get stuck in our belief systems. And if we never have anyone that asks us to challenge our belief systems, we just go on thinking that's normal or that's the best way to live or whatever. And, you know, it's no shot to Dave Ramsey. I think his program has helped a lot right. of people, but Agreed. that's not, it's not necessarily a one size fits all approach, you know? Yeah. So, so I think it's really, really important to be open-minded and to, to challenge your own thoughts and your beliefs about things to the possibility that there could be a better way. We're the real estate of mind show. And that's part of it, right? Is when, you, is when you're open yeah. like that. Cause like you said, if you had just said, no, 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 no I'm going to stick the course. I'm saying the course, that's it. Yeah. I got yeah. my blunders on. That's all I'm going to do. You wouldn't be where you are today. So I want to keep right. going with your story, but just, that's a good, uh, great point. Amber no, it's so, so good guys. I, I agree. I, I told my wife the other day on my gravestone on, on my tombstone, in addition to pepperoni, I want the words, he was getting better at this. Because I think that's a, I think that's a great better. way to go that's out. Gross. I it's like gross, that. Yeah, you know, it, it he is. was getting better at this. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you're 107 when that happens. But hopefully mm -hmm. it's yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we on that journey about the banker. Yeah, I want to know how that how that all sure. comes together because I think people want to know what does that mean? Be my own banker. Like, I don't understand that now. What's that mean? Well, think about it this way: if if let's say that you had a thousand bucks and you want to go deposit that money at the bank, all right? What do you do? You walk in, you hand them that the old school way is you walk in, hand them the cash or a check you deposit it, right? You deposit it. How much does the bank keep on the books and how much are they going to lend out to me, the guy behind you in line for a loan? Well, if you do the, if you do the research on this, uh, up until 2020, the number was 10%. So out of your thousand bucks, they'd keep a hundred bucks on, in the vault. 900 goes to me and I'm getting charged 10%. You're getting paid 0.1%. Yeah. All right. How much of the bank's money was in that deal? Zero. Zero. Yep. So we like those returns. That is approaching infinite uh, returns for a bank. That is why banks are always going to win. That's why so they're banks. Are, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I've come to find out that, you know, if, if banks control the environment where our money lives, they're going to win. If you control the environment where your money lives, you will win. Mm -hmm. End of story. That's powerful. So, you know, much like uh, the much like the environment where your money lives, uh, a fish will die if it's in the wrong environment. But right. if it's in the right environment, it's gonna happy. Oh, it's yeah. gonna be well fed, temperature cold, controlled in aquarium. It's gonna have lots of little baby fishies. So where's the right place for your money to live? And okay, so I went through the CFP training, studied about 450 financial products. I, that's when I kind of stopped counting at that point, and I started asking myself for myself as a negative net worth CFP at the time, how do I, where, where's the right place for my money to live? I want my money in the right environment so that it can thrive and multiply. So some of the things that I put on my little list was I wanted to have a good, predictable, competitive rate of return, but I also wanted it to be accessible to me. And I wanted there to be some sort of predictability to that access. I didn't want to beg a banker to get my money out of my key locker or, or my house or whatever else, right? And I wanted it to be tax-free and not penalize me if I want to use it for my daughter's college or my next flip. I didn't want it to be either or. I wanted it to be a big bucket of money that I controlled and was creditor protected against lawsuits. If I was going to be doing real estate investing, I didn't want a bunch of people suing me and taking my cash because that's inevitable in the real estate industry. We all know that. Sure. So that was kind of my little list. And, and there's, there were about seven or eight other uh, characteristics. But I think as a CFP, when we have a Zoom meeting with folks or have a one-on-one -on -one phone call, we like to say, hey, what do you want your money to do for you? And we just wave a magic wand for a minute and let them, you know, imagine without labels, without product names, without 
uh, specific things getting in the way or bias getting in the way. And then we ask them, all right, what do you want your money to do for you? And they give us that list. If you guys want to um, throw another magic wand moment in there, what, what do you, if you could just wave a magic wand, what would you want your money to do for you? Make more money. Yeah. Multiply. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Without a bunch of like head work, head work, leg work, right? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Easily. So, multiply easily. Yeah. And I've heard people say they want it to be tax free and wanted it to be, sure. you know, without penalties and leveraging it and leaving a legacy for their future. So for me, it was a big moment when I realized that of all things, my checklist was fulfilled by an old fashioned whole life insurance contract of all things. It, it blew me away, but all the way down the ladder from going from esoteric, I want to be a banker for myself down to how can a whole life policy do that for me? It, it met all the requirements. It, it grows on a competitive rate, not crazy, not going to beat the best year in the stock market, but it's going to beat my savings account, my checking account, my money market account, my bond portfolio. And so it also is accessible to me any year I want no matter what age I am, I don't have to be 59 and a half years old. I can get the money out. I can spend it on a fix and flip. I can sp spend it on my kid's college. I can spend it on my car or my kitchen remodel. There's no prohibited transactions. There's also no prohibited contribution limits. So like a Roth IRA, what do they let you do there? Six grand a year, seven grand a year if you're over 50. That's yeah. not gonna do a lot for our real estate projects. Right. So part of this was long range thinking and where's the environment where my money's gonna go? So whole life insurance, old fashioned whole life, way too riddled with commissions and expenses. So it was re-engineered uh, post Dave Ramsey's talking points, which is what I had to get past my own bias, but yeah. it's been re-engineered. If it's a bank on yourself designed whole life policy, it will have cut the commissions by about 70% and you get about eight to 40 times more cash in the policy year one. And that's a lot of cash. Yeah, so sure. right away, I've got a big bucket of liquid money. Even if I'm just putting in a nominal amount, I'll have a you know sizable cash that I can use as a financial management tool right from the start. So that's, so you, that's you, what we found. You, you, so you found for that product. So that's what you direct your clients towards. And that helps them be their own banker. It helps them have everything you just said, have access to the cash without and all penalties. that. Without penalties. I've got a fun right. little acronym because, uh, you know, um, acronyms are fun. Oh yeah. Uh, TGIF. I'll keep it brief, but uh, whole life insurance, if it's designed the bank on yourself way, and there's a lot that aren't, but if it's designed that specific way, it'll grow on a guaranteed basis. So T is taxes. So taxes, it's available income tax-free any year you want it. You can be 29 and a half, 59 and a half, 79 and a half. The money can be accessed both principal and gains without income tax due. With the current uh, tax law we have, it's always been income tax-free. So that's awesome. It's like a Roth IRA. Yeah. Second, it's uh, accessible and growing predictably and G is guaranteed. So it's on a guaranteed basis. I don't know anything much else in the financial universe that has that word in, in right. the contract. Yeah. Not even real estate, right? Um, yeah. The third is it's insurance. So it will leave my family. I is for insurance. I'll always leave my family more than I'll ever be able to save inside that policy. It's, you know, I put a thousand bucks in my savings account. I die tomorrow. Family's getting a thousand bucks. I put a thousand bucks in life insurance. I die tomorrow. My family's getting a heck of a lot more income tax free. Final thing, uh, financing. It allows me the right in the contract to borrow against my cash value and use it like a bank where it continues to grow even on the capital I borrow. So I'll say that again, because that's mind boggling. But yeah, if, I've right. got, if I've got like a hundred thousand bucks in cash value, and let's say I want to go buy a car within about three to five business days, I can request the money hits my bank account. And that year, my policy will give me the same guaranteed cash accumulation and dividend on the full 100,000 bucks as if I had not touched the money at all. And then so I that, am in control. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, oh, and then I'm, I'm in control, control of repaying that. Uh, I'm in, I'm in control of repaying that loan as I please. So I've got kind of a long-term question for you, and maybe you know th this is probably going to be a hard question to answer. But for example, we that's what he's here for. We we started <laughs> we started an Airbnb business, right? So around the country, hotels aren't liking that 
Airbnbs are out there because it's taking revenue away from them. What if this style of, you know, people becoming their own bank and doing things this way starts to piss the, the banking system off? You know, they've well, got a lot of power. Yeah. They can start changing laws and changing rules and yeah. I well, guess that's they not did that, a, so much of a question as <laughs> a statement. I guess, I guess anything could happen. Yeah. Um, and you're right. This, this year, anything could happen, right? That's yeah. right, man. Yeah. Murder hornets and aliens. Yeah. yeah. So um, th if they did that, they'd be biting their nose to spite their face because banks are some of the biggest purchasers of whole life insurance. Okay. In fact, Google uh, the words bank owned life insurance and you'll find just one or two of the mega ones out there that I know off the top of my head, like Bank of America has over $140 billion in their tier one capital. That's their safest money possible is in executive bonus life insurance and other uh, key person insurance policies. That's how much cash value they have. So if they did that, I guess they'd be messing with their own balance sheets, but so it's kind of say, a anything's possible. For them either way. Yeah, right, right. Okay. And it's kind of interesting. You know, what do the banks tell me to do with my money? Oh yeah, give it to them. Right. What do the banks do with their money? Oh yeah, put it in life insurance contracts and other safe cash assets. You know, in fact, they're required to by FDIC. So don't do what banks tell you to do with your money. Head Watch the what they do with theirs. Yeah, exactly. Mark, what what is the what is the maximum you can put into a life insurance policy? Is there a maximum? No, it's as much as the insurance company will allow you. So you know, it could be a could be a couple thousand a month, could be a couple hundred thousand a year. You know, depends oh, okay. if you're Mark, Mark Zuckerberg, a lot more than that, but sure. No but it, go, it goes in, it goes in post-tax. It's a post-tax mm -hmm. uh, contribution. Correct. But, that, and it, but when you pull it out, you're saying there's not a tax when you pull it out. Correct. Or you have to die to pull it out. No, no. Thank, thank God. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> At least I, I, I feel like I'm still around here. So Great for your yeah. family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, term insurance is the kind you only get if you croak. Right. And that's the kind you rent. That's sort of like renting life insurance. What we're talking yeah. about today is the kind of life insurance you own, where you're building up equity or cash value, not just a death benefit, although that's there too. What you have is a living benefit called cash value. And the cash mm -hmm. value is the part of the policy that we have rights to. We have the yep. ability to access as a withdrawal or a loan. Yep. Oh, amazing. Do me a favor, we're not done yet, but tell people how they can reach you and find you and learn more. You have a lot of just a great information. Tell people how they can find you. Thanks. Um, yeah, if folks want to dive deeper into this totally weird, not so average strategy. It's not, uh, it's very counterintuitive, but I think it's not that complicated once we start thinking like a banker. So mm -hmm. the best website for us is Not Your Average Financial Podcast. And you can go and listen to, we have over a hundred episodes on this and similar strategies, how we use it for real estate investing and other projects not your average financial podcast.com. So that's what I was going to tell people next is that in this, in this next part is I want to talk to people about how they, how they use that money for real estate investing. So obviously that's what we, our listeners are here to talk about real estate. We say the real estate of mind because we, just so you know, what we talk about in our world is, you know, if you don't have your mind right, the rest of you is not going to be, your business yeah. will just crumble. That's, that's the foundation of the business, but um, so not your average financial podcast.com. So how, how do they translate that to real estate investing? How does that connect? Well, yeah, mindset. If you think like a banker, you'll start acting like a banker. And, you know, that's a esoteric truth, but let's bring it all the way down the ladder and we can talk about some real applications, some real strategies. Um, so where should we begin? Do you guys want to start with a small case study design idea or kind of go big picture? What would you guys like sure, to do? I mean, what are, so a lot of our, a lot of our listeners are first time investors, you know, they're, they're kind of just getting started. So um, whatever might be applicable to, to them. Now we, we've done, you know, we've done approaching 700 flips here, I think. So we, awesome. we, we do a lot, but, but the average people that we have have done, you know, uh, from one to 10 or 12 or 15, you know, in that range. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Sure. That's congratulations yeah, guys. And other ones are looking to scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. how, can they, how can they use this strategy to, to help their real estate investing business? Yeah, it is a both and, uh, and it's important to realize this is kind of like, peanut butter and jelly, you know, they're better together. It's like nitro and glycerin, you know, it's like <laughs> Vilma and Louise. Yeah. Whole life insurance, it's fine by itself, I guess it'd be okay, but I wouldn't want it to just sit, soak and sour in my cash value for decades. The better way to do this is to be a banker to yourself and, and keep that money in motion. The, the phrase velocity of money comes to mind here. So it's not either or, it's both and. And here are four very easy steps to becoming your own banker and firing your real estate banker. 
Okay. So the first step, use the equity or cash value in your policy to purchase real estate. Step two, the policy will continue to grow even on the capital you borrow as you're doing your flip. Step three, you're controlling the repayment schedule on the policy that you own. So let's say your flip took you a little longer than you expected. What's a, what's a average time to flip for you guys? Five months. Five. If it took 10 months or a year, would that be way out of the range or is that possible? Oh, it's always possible. Okay. In 2020, uh, anything's possible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so if you got possible, a bridge yeah. loan or if you got a, if you got a bridge loan or if you got a mortgage and you didn't expect 10 months or a year and a half, then that's money that cuts into your profits. Well, what oh, right. if you could, what if you could control that repayment to the, to the bank that you own, to the policy that you own, where you have zero monthly payments, zero, you know, out of pocket costs mm -hmm. until you sell that property. And that's step three. So you control that repayment. Step four, sell your property, your flip, and recycle the money back into your policy to just do it all over again. So that's the four easy steps to becoming your own banker. It's sort of like, sort of like a self-directed IRA, but it has a life insurance component tied to it. We use a lot of self-directed IRA stuff. That's a lot we teach, but it's in that realm with maybe not as many rules. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. With self-directed IRAs, I'm a fan because now we're taking control and that's a characteristic of where I want my money to live. Um, you know, so back to our, our idea about environments and fishes. Um, but there are some strings attached with self-directed IRAs, aren't there? Uh, there's no oh, self-dealing. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, typically, there are maintenance costs from the IRA funds. Typically, oh, yeah. there are contribution limits and income phase outs. And some of them, if they're tax deferred IRAs, uh, where we're going to see required minimum distributions coming out where they force you to take the money out of that IRA in retirement, whether we are ready to sell that property in there or not. But you're right. There are a lot of overlaps. Um, in this case, I'm only aware of life insurance as a means for becoming your own source of financing, where you're able to borrow from the policy. And if it's bank on yourself designed, it'll continue to grow as if I never touched a dime of the money. That to me is the magic in this whole thing because you know, the problem is every time I spend a dollar in my self-directed IRA for that real estate deal, it's only in the real estate. So I either right. have it in my cash account or my real estate account, my real estate property. I can't do both. With the life insurance, I get the arbitrage in my policy and I get the real estate deal and I get, uh, well, if it's in the life insurance, I also get all the tax advantages of bonus depreciation and cost segregation, all the stuff accountants love to talk to you about. And then again, yeah, yeah you're in control of that repayment plan whenever you're ready to, to sell so that you're, property. So your return in the, in, the, in the life insurance policy, your return is minimal. I mean, it's small. It's a small, I don't know what it is. Couple yeah, three, six percent in that ballpark, middle single digits. But, but, like your, but, but to your point, so, so a portion, so you're saying the, the, the program that you have, it's interesting, the program that you have is that, because in my experience from 30 years ago, looking at life, whole life policies, there, you know, I have friends who are life insurance agents. There's a reason they get enormous commissions on those. There, there's right. a reason because they, because yeah. all goes the first year, it goes right to them. Right. So, so, and that I was thought to myself, okay, so I don't, my cash value is nothing. So when Zero. I'm first starting, but so here's a, here's a hypothetical example. Somebody comes to you and says, here's a hundred thousand dollars. How much cash is then available to them right away? Is that a fair question? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, hey. Depends on the age and health and all the other factors there, Glenn. Take but, me. Um, Take yeah, me. Yeah, I'm yeah. 50, 51 sure. good health. Okay, great. Um, no smoker, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right, round numbers. You know, if you, if you had the old fashioned whole life insurance, you are exactly right, Glenn. You'd, you'd see a big fat goose egg for your cash value, $0 in year one. And your insurance agent, you would see him waving at you on his yacht. Uh, so oh, yeah. <laughs> that's oh, what, yeah. <laughs> the hundred thousand oh, would go to know, him. They'd like you for that. Yeah. Right. Now there's a... Um, now, I will tell you this, uh, talk to asset center management and see who makes more between investments on Wall Street versus life insurance. There's a reason why the movie was called The Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, Just not watched it again last night. I watched some parts yeah. of it last night. Yeah, funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but for it, sure. But anyway, the, the more modern, uh, more efficient forms, the bank on yourself type, you'd have about somewhere between 65000 and 85000 bucks in cash right away within 30 days. And, and the insurance rough, agent would get roughly it. what kind of a life insurance size policy? A couple hundred thousand, a couple million. Um, could be on a hundred grand, um, depending on how you funded it. But it might be over a million bucks. Yeah, something like that. 
million five, something like that. So what did we just do? We, we paid for some insurance. Let's say it was 15, 20 grand for the cost of insurance. Sure. Now that hurts. Uh, but then you did buy a one to two million dollar death benefit there, and you have seventy, let's call it seventy thousand, seventy five thousand bucks of liquid cash that you can now borrow against and put to work in the real estate space. And over time, your cash will grow faster than your contributions. Somewhere around year four, I notice most of the time these policies now now in year four, let's say, let's say you've got four hundred and I don't know, $400,000 in cash value, plus or minus 420, something like that. And you're still accessing that policy. I'll give you a quick example with real numbers. There was a 45 year old who was putting in 32,000 bucks a year into a policy. And for 10 years and no more, he funded that policy. So 32,000 times 10 is 320. And -hmm. after 10 years, he had $400,000 of cash value. So all of his money plus gains. So he's got 400 grand. And he had a $1.9 million death benefit. That was before he borrowed for a, a purchase. In year 11, he'll take that loan out for 350,000 bucks. Now, did he need to ask a bank for that? No. Did he need to prove any kind of income or balance sheet or beg a banker or, you know, no, no. He asked for the money and in about five business days, the money's in his bank account. He puts that money to work, buying a, a nice multifamily flip. He waits five years, pays the loan off. And over that period of time, without him paying anything into the policy, it grew by 120,000 bucks, the policy did. Even though he had pulled all the money out, the policy itself went from 400,000 to 520,000 bucks on its own. That's pretty wow. darn good. Yeah. And he had the real estate deal and he had the rent and he had the, the profits from the flip and all the other things that he got to do over that five-year period. This is really a fancy, this is really, this has been a great podcast today because this, this is, you know, it's a, you know, you first started, I'm thinking, oh, it's like a life insurance pitch. Here we go. But, you know, yeah. and, you know and then I'm thinking, wait hey, a minute, the more, I'm, but the more you talk, the more it kind of makes sense, right? I'm sure you must mm-hmm. get that a lot. Oh, man. You know, uh, yeah, I was thinking, the biggest hmm. uh, critic of this is, and uh, yeah, my, my mind was like buzzing with Dave Ramsey's words. So, yeah, I'm with you all yeah. the way on that. No, that's interesting. That's, this is great. I think that our listeners need to know that this is a, you know, obviously you have to start something, but to go back to what my original question way back when was, um, and I know in Corona time it was like five hours ago, but so in, in yeah. going back to the question was you start, you didn't start by saying, I'll put a hundred thousand my first year. You probably start by saying, I'll put 2000 my first year or 1000 or whatever you can afford. You start with something and you start to build and it, you know, as we all know, once you start to build, when you look back in two, three, five, ten 10 years, you go, Wow. Wow. Look what I, what I did. But you're saying that you get to do that. You'll have a life, insu- you'll have a life insurance benefit, of course, because it's, kind of, it's like having a term policy in there, kind of. It's a, it's a, it's a policy, right? Life insurance mm-hmm. policy. You're getting interest on the whole. So I want to make sure I'm clear about that. Even though you've bought, let's say you have 300,000 in there, even though you've borrowed 250 of it to do a project, mm-hmm. you're still getting the overall, let's say it's 3% yep. on the whole. Yep. Correct. That is so correct. You're getting, you're getting interest on the whole, even though they're not using the whole. Mm-hmm. And yet you're using the money on the outside. So you could even use that to be a private lender on the outside or whatever you want to do. That's, ex- that's a, a lot of our clients do exactly that. They'll do bridge loans this way. They'll do private money this way. They'll do fix and flips. I uh, had a lady who had a hundred and what she have? She had 150,000 that went into the policy. Her only payment was that 150 grand that went in. Then she borrowed out within 30 days. She borrowed out 120,000 mm-hmm. bucks, bought a property and she was buy, hold and rent. That was her strategy. Mm-hmm. And so she just got the rent check about 1100 bucks a month and the policy continues to grow. Like all the cash is still in there as if she hadn't touched that money. And, and she, she doesn't gets have, the rent check. She doesn't have to put the rent check because a self-directed IRA, that rent check has to go back in the self-directed IRA. You have to, you, there's fees and stuff you can charge yourself legally, but you don't get to, okay. How interesting. Yeah, but, but with this, you don't have to pay the loan off to the policy at all. As long as the policy is in force, when you pass away, what they'll do is they'll take your, your death benefit, subtract the loan when right. you pass away. Right. And your family gets the rest. Right. So they get the insurance part of it, which is. Mm-hmm. Huh. And the other advantage is something that we always teach too. And that's the speed of money. Because if you go and get a bank loan for doing a house, you know, it takes forever to close, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, whatever, yes. depending yeah. on the bank and all the other details. You said you can get your money out in five days. So mm-hmm. that speed of, of being able to do the turnover is is also really an advantage. Well, this has been 
I, I was just going to say too, it's, it is very eye opening. You know, even Glenn and I, as, as many people as we've been around and the, the masterminds that we're in, this is definitely a new way of, of looking at how to do your finances and, and do deals and everything. So I think, it, I think it's just important for our listeners to stay open-minded and stay open to growth and stay open to learning and not have, you know, that, that ego that thinks you have to know it all mm-hmm. because you can learn every day. Yeah, so true. So well, true. This, has been, this has been awesome. Tell everybody again how they can get a hold of you. This is great. If you want to, if you want to save money and start to be your own bank, which makes now this all kind of came full circle, makes a lot of sense. Be able to fund your own flips and fund your own real estate and without all the headaches of a self-directed IRA and limitations of how much you put in all that good stuff too. Right. There's no, right. yeah. Okay. How do they reach you, Mark? Yeah. Uh, not your average financial podcast.com folks can click on request a meeting and I'd be happy to do a phone call or a zoom call. Uh, to just answer questions, either me or one of my associates will connect and we'll just do a quick phone call, 15, 20 minutes, just to see what's further, see if this is a good fit. I will balance this out, guys. I know I, I'm at the very end, but don't do this just because you heard it on a podcast, even as cool as, uh, as Real Estate of Mind show. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing this correctly. There's a ton of insurance policies out there that are not right. There's 400,000 insurance agents oh, out there. That's one for every 800 <laughs> Americans. Wow. So make sure this is done the bank on yourself way. That's the best thing I can say to you at the end of this show, but go do your research and then uh, reach out to a bank on yourself professional. Yeah. I think, I think, I think they should reach out to you. I mean, I think, you know, anybody that has that kind of information, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's going to the right people that know how to make your life simple. We're all about making the right connections to make your life simple. Right. So uh, I encourage our listeners to go check you out and have a conversation. Thank so thanks so much for being here today, Mark. It's been great having you and I uh, appreciate it. Thank awesome, you so guys. much. Thanks. Awesome guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks guys so much. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review and leave us your questions and comments and we will personally answer and please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.